Open your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. It doesn't read that he that repent, repents has, ever, has everlasting life. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm struggling tonight with my voice. It says, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. If this is the first time you watched, or if maybe you've been watching for a while, but you really haven't listened to or you haven't read through at least the first three chapters of Change of Mind, Volume 1, I encourage you to do so. You'll have a totally different perspective on the word repent, repentance, repenting, and how shortly after the disciples or the apostles were no longer alive, things started changing. The definitions of Greek words started to change, where repentance became to mean something totally different than a change of mind. So I encourage you to catch up. I believe it will enlighten your life and give you a, a whole new perspective of what Christ and God is looking for. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me hath everlasting life. You know what's really miserable? Believing in a false gospel. It's probably a misery like no other. It's really agony. And it doesn't take long if you turn on your television, especially on Sunday. You will we'll see well-meaning individuals who, without even realizing, teach biblical flaws or biblical flawed plans of salvation that are nowhere to be found in the Bible. These accursed messages of a false gospel flood the world. It's worldwide. And it's doing it at a rapid pace unlike any other time in history. I believe for one crucial reason. See, our enemy knows his time is growing short. And he desires to keep as many people as possible from understanding the simplicity of Christ's free gift of salvation. They're well meaning for the most part but they have done more damage than good. Most of them, with their flawed plans, preach that sinners can reach heaven through their own works and deeds. No, you can't. 
And that's what this ministry, hopefully, has been communicating to you. Delivering the truth of what Christ says about the gift of salvation. <clears throat> and hopefully we are arming many, many, with the knowledge that is necessary for anyone to be able to de detect what I believe is the greatest weapon against mankind in the arsenal of our adversary, Satan and his evil minions. Obviously, he's weaponizing, unfortunately, too many so-called Christians to preach a false gospel. And what it's done is con people into living the Christian lifestyle, whatever that is, without ever being born again, or a better translation of that, born from above. Kind of pains me when I come across these individuals that peddle this type of false doctrine, a false <clears throat> gospel. What is the true gospel? It starts by saying that God has declared that we are sinners. And no matter how many behavioral changes you go through, no matter how many good works you are a part of, it could never make you holy enough to enter heaven. It just can't. The gospel, the true gospel, says God sent His only begotten Son to pay for all of our sins. What does that mean? Jesus paid for our crimes by dying on that cross for us all. His dead body was buried in a grave and on the third day Jesus arose from the dead and now his blood is displayed in the heavenly mercy seat. That precious blood, I've preached it enough, that removes all of mine and yours sins. Past, present, and all the future sins. He reconciled us back to the Father. That's what Jesus did. That is the gospel. And the instant you believe this, the instant you have confidence and start trusting, trusting what God's Word said, what Jesus did for you, He knows it. And He saves you. Period. No works, no behavioral changes, none of that stuff. He saves you. Because your belief in Him, your trust and confidence that His redeeming work was sufficient. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, John 6, 47, put it up again, He that believeth on me have everlasting life. The free gift is based solely upon your trust in what Jesus did for you. And it has absolutely nothing at all to do with 
to do with what you did for him. Nothing whatsoever. Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll put it up on the screen, but if you choose to do so, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It has nothing at all to do with what you do for him. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. There's a lot of boasting going on about how Jesus is going to let me in because look at all my good works. Look how I'm behaving. I'm a model Christian. I don't even know what that is. Except if you look at the Bible characters and see what eventually how they pleased God. And that was just basically to trust in Him. To trust in His Word. And what God has asked us to do is to trust in His only begotten Son. And what He did for us. And I have people write to me all the time. Saying that's all good, but I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if Jesus will accept me. I just don't believe I'm not good enough. The problem is they make the mistake of thinking that they have to rely on themselves to earn their way to God. Let me tell you right now, October 5th, 2020, it's true today and every day previously since Adam's sin. You can't earn your way to God. You just can't. And here's the kicker. God doesn't want you to. He never asked you to, to do such a thing. He made the way. And the way is named Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Well, I just feel worthless. Let me tell you something. You are not worthless. You are loved. I came from ministry, and I was there longer than anyone else. But on occasion, even that pastor would make people feel in a sense worthless. And there's a very small group of people that listen to me that came from that same ministry. If you're honest with yourself, you 
you know what I'm saying is the truth. It's one of the things that I never accepted as it was says, said on occasion that you're nothing but a, a palace cabala. I'm sorry. That's not what the scriptures proclaim. Believe me when I say that you are not worthless. You are loved. The Almighty God, the Creator of all things, loved you so much in your sinful state that He sent His Son to save you and to save me. Your deeds may be worthless, and it's definitely worthless if you think you're going to earn your salvation by deeds. But you're not worthless. <clears throat> Just think about it. If you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus Christ, and if you believe that God is in control, you have to come to the understanding, you have to acknowledge that you are here by design. You are not a mistake. You are here by design. And guess who the designer was? Him. It's his design. What am I saying? You're put on this earth for a purpose. Your life is precious to him. He was willing to die for it. Your life is part of his plan. And he has a plan for all of us. You're unique. You're special. God's word says you're a masterpiece, and I'll get there in a minute. Think about what I'm saying. Just before you or I were conceived, you were involved in one huge race. An unbelievably huge race. The single cell, think about it, would eventually combine with another single cell that eventually would become you. Guess what that single cell had to do? It had to outrace 280 million other single cells that were not you. That's 280 million. If you think about it, you have a better chance of winning the lotto. The last time I checked, and it could be higher than that now, it was 175 million to one to win, I believe it was the Powerball. Your single cell had to outrace 280 other million single cells to become you. You won the race. That is amazing, my friends. When you think it In those terms, and God decided it was that single cell that would begin your life 
that eventually become you. Your odds of winning were 1 in 280 million. You have a better chance of winning the lottery than beat out all those other cells, which you did, and you came into existence. And here you are. You're the winner. You won the race. Back to, if you believe God is in control of this cosmos, that out of at least 280 million other options, He chose you. He chose me to make me, to make you. You don't have this verse, so they won't put it up on the screen, but Psalm 139. I'll find the verse quickly. Verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully, bad translation, it's not really I don't know, a word I don't believe, but it should read, for I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well or greatly. It's a better translation. I will praise thee, for I am, what David would say here, I am awesome. He was not being egotistical. He's reflecting what God produced and allowed to come into existence and wonderfully made. Marvelously, marvel, marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth greatly. I preached this before, but Ephesians We read verses 8 and 9 in chapter 2, but you continue in verse 10. It says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God, had ordained before, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are His workmanship. It can be translated also, we are His masterpiece. Now, when you think of masterpiece, you usually think of an artist. An artist, when he creates a masterpiece, usually is, it's his best work that he created. Just think about it. The God that created the universe, the constellations, the earth, the planets, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, the Grand Canyon, the giant trees, the sequoias, down to a delicate rose, and not to mention everything that he created as far as creatures and how amazing they are. Whether they're walking this planet or flying in the air, He decided, decided long ago to call us his masterpiece. Out of everything he created, he makes it a point to call us his masterpiece. Don't ever insult him by saying that you're worthless. We are his masterpieces. Yes, we 
They were born into sin because of Adam's actions. But he loved us so much that he was willingly, or willing, excuse me, to send his only begotten son to rescue us. Usually an artist, when he paints a masterpiece, he has a price he would like to sell that masterpiece for, but usually the value is of that masterpiece is off based on what a buyer is willing to pay for it. Value is always dictated by the buyer, especially in the artist's world or in the collector's world. The same thing is true for you and me. John 3.16, I know you have this scripture. Put it up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved the cosmos, literally, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now Jesus lived a perfect life. Something we can never do. He was murdered, he was killed, he was tortured horribly and eventually died on the cross. You think any of that surprised God? It was all part of His plan. <clears throat> he loved the world, which includes us, so much that He sent His Son to save it. all along knowing what his son would have to go through. Why? Because he believed we were worth it. So, the next time you start thinking that you are worthless, and I want you to hear this closely, Remember that your value is based on what God paid for you. Your value is based on what God paid for you. God bought you with the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. So your value is never decided but what you do or do not do. It's all based on what Jesus did, period. And according to the scriptures, you are not worthless, you are priceless. And to say anything different is to mean everything that Christ did on that cross. I'm not saying that sometimes we don't act like jerks, idiots. I wish I could say something a little bit more saltier, but I won't. But nevertheless, I repeat, our value is not based on what we do or not do. It's, um, it's always based on what Jesus did. Listen, we don't always measure up 
to God's standard. In fact, I don't remember the last time I did it, to tell you the truth. God's standard is too high. I can never achieve that. Neither can you. But that does not mean you're not valuable to God. That's not the criteria any longer. Your value based on what Jesus did is priceless to God. And He, and He alone decides what your worth is. Jesus made himself available to us. That's why we remember what he did. That's why he commands us to remember what he did. You might not have felt worthy to come to him because of whatever teaching you ever received, or maybe you didn't receive any. But it didn't stop him trying to get to you. That's the wonderful Savior we serve. He came to this planet. He came to this planet called Earth to save us. He came to this planet to give us a future and hope. So what am I saying tonight? Don't let anybody tell you anything different about what your value is to God. It's priceless. Through Jesus, we are his masterpieces. He loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to pay the penalty, the punishment that we deserved. Jesus took upon himself to receive it all for our benefit so we wouldn't have to. That's why the door is still open to receive that type of grace. It will close soon. And what happens after that is another topic which I've been preaching on in the last day series. But now is the time to put our focus in Christ and what He's done for us. I've been saying it for many years now. It's all about Jesus. So when we go to this table tonight, the elements, you don't even need elements. You can remember what Jesus did for you without the elements. Thank Him, praise Him. Acknowledge what He's done by putting your complete focus on what he did, not what you think you might be able to do to earn salvation or keep your salvation. Let me tell you right now, salvation, receiving it and keeping it has always been about Jesus, not about you. Works do come into play. But that's separate from salvation. That's part of your discipleship work. Which gives you the wonderful opportunity to earn eternal rewards. It benefits others when those works are for the cause of Christ. Because they too then will receive Jesus as their Savior. And we get the benefit, not only seeing and being really excited and joyful to see someone rescued from, we know it's coming. But you get to earn eternal rewards, inexhaustible rewards, for your participation as, your, as his disciple. But when it comes to remembering Jesus and salvation, the focus is on Him and Him alone, 
His works, not ours, but His. And He commands us to do this in remembrance of Him. He did it at the this Last Supper because everyone has to eat or has to drink. What a perfect opportunity if you haven't done so in a day throughout your activities to stop and remember when you do have a meal what Christ has done for you. Even if you don't have any elements, it doesn't matter. Just remember what Jesus did for you. And there's a further promise. He's returning. And He's coming for all of us. So tonight, October 5th, 2020, we're still remembering Jesus and what He did. What a wonderful Savior. Take the elements. Play a song.